Well, we're going to go ahead and get started here tonight. Glad you're here this evening, and, and we're going to sing one song together. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, so we're going to sing five, well, well, it is 505, but it really doesn't matter what the number is because it's on the screen behind you. So we'll all stand together. Everybody seems in a really good, relaxed mood, so I don't think you have any problems standing tonight. If I got to stand, you got to stand, and I'm just teasing. All right, here we go. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. my soul's best song, faithful, being service to, to him belongs. You can do that. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help love lifted me souls in danger look above Jesus completely saves he will lift you by his love out of the angry waves he's the master of the sea billows his will obey he your savior wants to be got us in a really good habit of doing that. So I saw some of you doing it. It's like others may be thinking, what are, you, what are you guys doing? Love lifted me. So, all right, well, let's go ahead and we'll have a word of prayer and ask the Lord to work in the service tonight. And I'm just going to ask, um, let's see, I'm going to ask Alana, see if you don't mind. Glad, glad to have Alana back with us from the land of fruit and nuts, California. So, Lonis, you go ahead and lead us in prayer, please. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, Brother Nick's helping over with the teens tonight is because uh, Per Kickman is up in Fairmont right now in the emergency room, second day in a row. Uh, I won't go into all the things, but uh, he was in the emergency room there at UHC for quite a while yesterday evening, did come home, and then he fell earlier this afternoon, so Paul and Patty have taken him up to the emergency area there at the old Fairmont General. So if you would pray for Perk, uh, trying to get some answers 
uh, for him. And of course, pray for Patty uh, with his care. God will just give her strength as well. A few things I want to mention to you before we take prayer requests tonight on our list. So if you look at your prayer list, and there on the left-hand side, about oh, 12 names down or so is uh, Davy Daves' family. He and Melissa and Michaela all have COVID. Uh, is Dave in the back? All right, he must be making his rounds right now. So we'll find out. Okay, Dave, have you heard any more about your son's family? Okay. All right. So we'll keep praying for them. God will just give them strength. And, uh, and then at the very bottom of the left-hand side is Matt Huntington. This is a pastor up in Grafton at Lighthouse Baptist. And uh, he had some growths removed in a surgery uh, several months ago. And the, those things came back. So he just had surgery yesterday. And so if you would continue to remember Matt Huntington with with his uh, surgery it was successful but uh, I, I don't know that all that that entails but he certainly needs prayer and i'm going to read to you a couple things here uh, with those who are on our prayer list concerning missionaries uh, the first is with uh, kim and lewis howe it says we cannot thank you enough for your faithful prayers we had kim's follow-up appointment today from a recent breast cancer surgery it was not the outcome we were praying for, but we do know, we do not doubt that all is in God's hands. Her diagnosis has been upgraded from low grade DCIS. And does anybody know what DCIS means? Okay, I don't know uh, what that means, but it's been look, upgraded from low grade to high grade. She's now just one step below invasive breast cancer. Now they are recommending radiation treatments. Everything has been pushed through quickly so far, so we anticipate radiation treatments to start soon. She will have more routine mammograms for the first five years because this cancer is a high risk to develop into an invasive cancer within five years. We will know more by next week or as soon as we meet with a specialist. So um, just ask for us to pray for Kim. You know, start out with the uh, cancer in the um, appendix and now they found the cancer in the breast cancer as well so she needs a lot of prayer there in New Zealand and this is from Philip Wilde uh, when we've read his prayer letters when he was able to be in India you know he worked with a national pastor whose last name is Kumar and so this concerns Pastor Kumar it says we are overwhelmed with responses regarding Pastor Kumar thank you for praying for him we ask that you keep praying. Pastor Kumar's son has told me the following. All of these issues started after he took his first COVID vaccine shot. After getting the vaccine, he began struggling with breathing. After taking a test, he tested positive for COVID. Then he began to have strokes and seizures. Now he, now he did previously have a stroke in 216. He had recovered from that. I asked his son if there has been any health issues over the last year. His son told me that he has been healthy and that there has been no issues until the vaccine was given. He is still in ICU in a very critical condition. The doctors are saying that there is nothing more they can do at this time due to the shortages of oxygen, hospital beds, lockdowns, etc. Transferring him to a better hospital is not a possibility. Also, the nature of Indian hospitals is that all payment is due up front or every couple of days. Hospital cost has gone up due to the high demand. If one cannot pay, then they simply send the patient home. Please pray that they would be able to pay uh, to this high demand. If one cannot pay, uh, again, they send them home. Uh, please pray that they would be able to pay for the bills. The hospital would allow them to delay payment or administer care without needing all of the upfront money. So. Things are certainly different in India than they are here. So if you would remember to pray for Pastor Kumar, his name is not actually on the list. So if you want to add his name there on the physical list for Pastor Kumar there in India with the COVID issues that he's going through. All right, we'll go ahead now and we will open it up to any requests. I won't come down tonight. So we'll just have you mention them and I'll relay them on Daisy.
Dot Olmeyer. is a lousy birthday week. <laughs> Madeline, Madeline Feathers. Feathers. Okay. All right, so for those at home, the first request was Marvin Marsh, who's just sick overall, and then Chelsea Stottlemyre dealing with COVID, and then seven-year-old Madeline Feathers who broke both ankles and is having intestinal issues. So pray for them. Okay, anyone else? Uh, Leslie? Well, I think it's going to be a surprise. Oh, I don't know. Maybe they're going to go to the next year or maybe they have a So we'll pray for Logan and, of course, Chris. They got to open up a door just to plainly give them the gospel there in the hospital. And you said that's going to happen. It's supposed to be today. Oh, okay. So he's going to go to the house. Okay. All right. We'll pray for Chris to be able to, to do that. Um, so this boy's a teenager then, I imagine. Okay, all right. And that is not good. Anyone else? Any other request? Carrie? Oh, Amy. And her first name is Jolene. Anyone else? Uh, Ethan. Is he fairly young? That's young. Well, okay. Somebody else had their hand up. What, Heather? Certainly will. All right, so Jerry and Marion, and of course we have Michael and Lydia, as, as was mentioned, over on the spiritual list. So pray for, pray for that meeting that God would use it for good. That that's encouraging that they're willing to come in and talk. That's good. Anything else? Anything else? Okay. It does. Well, we know he has. That, that's been very apparent because we've seen it happen. Our insurance agent for the church, 
uh, was literally on his deathbed. And he had called, he has like 19 kids. Glenn Wright says 19 kids. He has a daughter that's a missionary in Mexico. Called all the kids in to say their goodbyes. And uh, I, I made a bad mistake in not having to come and give his testimony here at Grace. I wish I would have. Uh, but he, his testimony is, is tremendous. But God did. He, he raised him up and healed him. So there's not a point we give up until God says, I'm promoting him to heaven. We just we don't give up. So we keep praying for Mike Lambert and for these others too. Juanis. So, so that's Nina. So Nina McGinnis, so you want us to keep her on the list or take her off? Okay. All right. Praise the Lord. Okay. All right. We'll keep keep remembering that. And Chris. Uh, Miss Caroline commented on Facebook and said that uh, the Holland family, uh, their their cousins of hers, had a death in the family. So to be praying for them. Okay, that was Brian Holland, the one that passed away. I'm sorry. She didn't say. Okay, so who who was this one, Chris? Uh, it was Mrs. Davis. She said uh, cousins of hers named the Hollands uh, had a death in the family. I'm having trouble understanding. So I, I, what was, it was a member of the Holland family? Holland family? Okay, so that's uh, so somebody passed away. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. I just didn't understand that. It's a good thing because if you guys were sending all your requests to me, I'd probably misunderstand half the things you're telling me. I'm sure the Lord has a good time sometimes with us. I know he does with me. He laughs a lot. I make him laugh a lot. Okay. Anything else? Going once. All right, we'll keep those handy, and we'll go to prayer later on. And, uh, you know, it's a kind of a cliche, but it's true. Prayer changes things, and it does. It really does, and it's worth your time and effort to spend time alone in prayer. It's worth your time and effort to pray here, so I encourage you to stay a little while <clears throat> after the service. Take time to pray for others. I'm going to have you take your Bibles tonight. And I want you to go to <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, our missionary guest, Mike Wallace, uh, actually preached from this passage. And uh, I'm going back there to look at one verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 19. I'm going to have a word of prayer, and then we'll get right into the scripture tonight. Father, I thank you for the opportunity and the privilege of being in this house Thank you, Lord, for this church family. Lord, I thank you for the things that, even in the uh, climate that we've had over the last year and four months or so, you've, you've allowed us to keep the doors open. You've allowed us to gather together, and we thank you for those things. Lord, we, we anticipate you answering prayer, because that's what you do, and we've, we've seen you do that. It's the Lord. Help us never have the attitude of doubt, whether it's toward Mike Lambert or Lexi Patton or Nina McGinnis or any of these who have struggled with cancer. Help us, Lord, not to give up on others who seem not to have such uh, drastic sicknesses. Lord, you can heal the small. You can heal the difficult. You are the God of all healing. So God, help us to believe you. And also help us to believe that what your word says is true and help us to make the choice in our lives daily to believe your word, just to believe it, to accept it for what it says. And so this, this simple subject tonight that we look at is actually an important subject for each of us because you require it of us. So I ask you to teach us from your word tonight and we look forward to the time of prayer afterwards. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19, it says, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And I, my focus is on the second uh, portion, the second phrase of this verse, I have made myself servant unto all. Paul begins here by saying, I'm actually free from all men. And I got to thinking about that statement, and that was certainly true of the Apostle Paul in his life. Uh, we're told that Paul had no bondage upon him because of being uh, in servitude to Rome, because he was a Roman citizen. He was a freeborn man. They were told that in Acts 22, verses 27 and 28. Then the chief captain came and said unto him, and said, or said unto him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? He said, Yea. And the chief captain answered, With a great sum obtained I this freedom. And Paul said, But I was freeborn. So Paul was free from all men in the sense that he was not like most of those around him. He was not like his, his brethren, the Jewish uh, believe, or, uh, folks there in Israel who were in, literally in bondage to Rome. He was not bound. He truly was a free man. So he was superior in this sense. He was a citizen of Rome. In his Jewish faith, remember he was a Pharisee of the Pharisee, so he took a backseat to no one. And as a Christian, he was an apostle of Jesus Christ. So in all these ways, he's in a sense superior in his Jewish walk. He's superior in his Christian walk. As a physical citizen, he is superior to others. And so he's really, he doesn't answer to any man. He has no, in a sense, obligation to any man. He is free from all men. But he chose to make himself, uh, in a sense, accountable to all men. You know, in a sense, that's one of the curses of being an American. We don't have to answer to anybody. We are free men. And so we, many times, we don't make ourselves subject to others. But that's what a servant does. A servant makes himself subjugated. He makes himself subject to others. But that's not our mentality. And many times when a person gets saved, that mentality is hard for a new believer to accept because they're so rooted in freedom that they are, in a sense, free from all men. They answer to no one. And that is not what God expects of me or you as a child of God. And so I just want you to notice tonight as we look at this, I just want you to notice from that statement the fact that if you are going to be the servant that God expects you to be, it's going to have to be something in the sense that you make yourself because this is not something naturally that we uh, seek to attain. This is something that you have to, in a sense, make yourself. And that's where we're going to focus tonight. And what would make Paul motivated to have such an attitude in his life? Because that's exactly what he saw in Jesus Christ. That's the way Jesus Christ uh, conducted his life. And just for example, say you could go back to John chapter 13. John chapter 13 in this passage in which Jesus there in that upper room before they go out to Olivet or to the Mount of Olives, to the garden, he lays aside his garments and puts a towel upon himself and goes out and kneels, kneels down and washes all the disciples' feet, including Judas. I always make mention of that because that's pretty amazing to me that he would wash the man's feet, humble himself to the man who was about to kill him, murder him. He did those things, and in John chapter 13, verse 13, after he had washed the disciples' feet, he said, this is the reason I did what I did. Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, notice, happy are ye if ye do them. It's not good enough just to know the truth. 
We have to live the truth. We have to live the truth. And Jesus Christ sets the example, and it's not just through this simple act. His whole ministry has been nothing but servanthood. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, which being in the form of God, found not not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him what? The form of a servant. Made himself into a form of a servant. And he served people his entire life upon this earth. He served. He began by serving his parents. He began by serving the rabbis in the, in the synagogue that he attended all of his life. Even into his ministry, he attended that synagogue whenever he was there. The Bible tells us that. It was, it, was, it, was, it was his custom, the Bible says. It was his habit to be in the synagogue and in, in God's house every Saturday, every Sabbath day he was there. That was his habit. That should be our habit. It shouldn't be a question about whether we're going to be in the house of God. The doors are open, we should be there. That was Jesus' habit. And he was a servant to those folks. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 18, the Bible says, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my well-beloved, and whom my soul is well-pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. That's a, a fulfillment of what the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 42, 1, that Jesus came as a servant to the Father, and as a servant to you and me. He was a servant. And so what made Paul say, I am free from all men, but I'm making myself, I'm making myself be a servant to men. It was the example that he had from his own Savior. And there's no greater example for you or for me to follow than the example of our Savior. What he did, we should be willing to do. Can I ask you, do you have, do you have a servant's heart tonight? Do you live your life as a servant? And it was not something to be embarrassed by. By that I mean it wasn't something that no one wanted to be known as a servant. In fact, I've pointed this out before, and I'll point it out again, that when the apostles or those men who wrote the letters, the epistles in the New Testament, when they gave their salutations, they always introduced themselves, not as apostles, uh, not as children of God, not as saints, they always introduce themselves as servant. Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. James 1.1, 1, 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Jude 1.1, 1, 1, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ. And then finally, in the book of Revelation, there in chapter 1, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ unto his servant, John. That was the moniker they loved to wear. They gladly were the servants of Jesus Christ. And you cannot be a servant of Jesus Christ without being a servant to men. It is impossible. If you're truly a servant, if I am a servant of Jesus Christ, then I will be a servant to men. I'll be a servant to my wife. I'll be a servant to my children. I'll be a servant to those in my church family. That will be the reality of my life. And if I'm not really a servant of Jesus Christ, I'll struggle in those other relationships, being willing to serve people, being willing to reach out and minister to them. By the way, just kind of thought about this, Keith. Um, you remember, you remember the, the foot washing that we did? <laughs> We're not going to do that tonight. I'll never again do the foot washing. But yeah, we those who weren't here, first or second year I was here. As pastor, I, I decided to give a vivid image of foot washing and you know having a servant's heart. So I had Keith come up here and take off his shoes and socks, and I and I washed his feet in front of the congregation. I don't know if it had any good effect on the congregation or not, other than he is crazy. <laughs> but anyway, we had a foot washing. These men counted a privilege to be servants. They counted a privilege to be servants. So tonight what I want to do, maybe into next week, but at least tonight, I want to look at the characteristics of a servant. And the first place I want you to turn is Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, and look at verse 13. The characteristics of a servant. In Luke chapter 16, verse 13, the Bible says, No servant can serve two masters. 
For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You know what the term mammon means. You can't serve God in riches. You can't serve God in wealth. It's, it's impossible. But you know what? We could, not violating the scriptures, we could remove the word mammon and replace it with any other thing. You cannot serve God and you just in, in, in put in place whatever comes to mind because, quite frankly, a lot of believers, we all do to some degree, but a lot of believers struggle with two masters or or attempting to serve two masters. The characteristics of a servant. A servant has undivided loyalty. A servant has undivided loyalty. And too many Christians struggle with divided loyalty. I'm going to serve Jesus Christ, but I'm also going to serve self, or I'm going to serve, you name it. Undi you know, God says, no, no, it's me alone. It's me alone, not your family, not your attempts to gain uh, prosperity, whatever it is, it, it is me alone. You are to be totally dedicated to me, no other master. And so many times that is not the case. So a, a servant shows the characteristic of, of an undivided loyalty. So I ask you tonight, are you totally loyal to Jesus Christ so that if he says to you do this and you'll do it or do that and you'll do it whether it's some menial task or whether it is something that will forever alter your life if God were to say to you you know sometimes you hear preachers like me say these things what if God were to say to you uproot your family and go to Mexico or go to Spain. Are you enough of a servant that you say, I, I will do that. I will do it. Undivided loyalty. Do you have the characteristic of a servant of God with undivided loyalty to him? The second thing is found in Matthew 10, verse 24. So Matthew chapter 10, and I want you to look at verse 24. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? So the second characteristic I look at here is this. A servant is not above his Lord, or we could say a servant is submissive. The word above means superior. The servant is not superior to the master, is he? Well, we know that, that to be the truth. The servant is not above, is not superior to his master. And I fear that this is why some of God's people really refuse to be obedient and loyal to Christ is because in their subconscious they have placed themselves above their master. I know better than Jesus Christ knows. I know he's telling me I should do this or go this direction, but I know better than he does. I'm superior to him. Lord, help us if we have that kind of an attitude because the true characteristics of a servant, not only will he give undivided loyalty, but he will be submissive because he is not above his Lord. Whatever his Lord says, he will do. He will do. And by the way, this has always been an issue. It's been an issue for me. It's been an issue for everyone who's ever had children. You hindering your children by lording over them instead of letting God direct them. Letting God tell them what he wants done with their lives. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with a parent saying, you know, you seem to have skills in this particular area, maybe you ought to think about, you know, carpentry, or you think about, you know, going to an accounting, or whatever it may be. There's nothing wrong with those things. 
but there have been plenty of times where a parent has hindered a child from doing God's will simply because they didn't want to go away, simply because, you know, as has been said, you're not, never going to make enough money in ministry. You know, you can't make a living that way. You can't support a family that way, blah, 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 all these things. Let me tell you, if you consider yourself a servant of Jesus Christ, then it will show in the characteristics of a servant, and you will give undivided loyalty to him and say, God, whatever you say is what I want for not only myself, but I want for my family. And you will be one who is not above your Lord, and you will instead, instead of being superior to your Lord and thinking you know better than the Lord for your child or even for your mate or for whatever the situation may be, you will submit to him and say, God, what you want is what I want, not what I want. What you want is what I want. Third characteristic, go to Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. And by the way, I think every parent struggles with that. Every parent. Every parent. Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, the Bible says, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. The third characteristic is this. A servant seeks to please God, not men. A servant seeks to please God and not men. It's real easy to want to be a man pleaser. And Paul warned the Ephesians of this in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 6. He said, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. Whatever you do, you do it to please God. Whatever you do. If you want to save yourself a lot of frustration, if you want to save yourself a lot of doubt, do whatever you do to please God, not men. Uh, you know, when I got in ministry, uh, I, I worked down in Atlanta for 11 years, and in that particular situation, I was not required to mow lawns or change oil in vans or plant flowers or any of those kind of things. When I came up here in 1995, after 11 years of that kind of ministry, I came up here as youth pastor, and Pastor and I just said, Jeff, I'm going to have you change oil in vans and wash them every week or whatever, and gas them up. Okay. I'm going to have you plant flowers in the spring and weed them and take care of them. Okay. I'm going to have you mow lawn. Oh. Oh. Now, you see the property we have now. We started, when I first came here in 95, it was just this particular track of land. You know, it wasn't that big of a deal. And then we purchased that piece of land. And then later we got that piece of land. And there was, I remember mowing this whole thing with a push mower. It took me all day to do it. And by the time I was done, my body was doing this. Just, oh. Now, Pastor and Isley, of course, at that time, we didn't have all of this yet, but um, that was part of the requirement. And I'm going to be honest, and I'm ashamed of this. You know, I'd go out there and start m mowing lawn, and, you know, I would mow it on Fridays normally, so it looked nice for the weekend, and I'm out there mowing, and I'm grumbling under my, my breath. This isn't what a man of God is supposed to do. You know, I'm a man of God. I'm, I'm clergy, huh? you know. I just didn't have the backwards collar on or anything, but I, you know, I'm clergy. I'm not supposed to be doing these kind of things. And, and I, I would grumble. I wouldn't say that to Pastor Nisley. I wouldn't say that to other people, but I, in my spirit, I was grumbling. And then one day the Holy Spirit says, to whom are you doing this? For whose sake are you doing this? And God, through his Holy Spirit, began to convict me that my attitude was wrong, and that what I was doing was not to please him. I wasn't trying to please God. I wasn't trying to be a servant to God when I pushed the lawnmower. I wasn't trying to be a servant of God when I went back here to this ditch and I parked that van over that ditch so I could get low enough to get underneath and change the oil. I, I wasn't doing it to serve God. I was, I was doing it with a bad attitude is what I was doing. And God convicted me. You know what? You know what? I just, I just said to you that I wasn't having a, spirit, or a servant spirit. I wasn't following the example of Christ. 
God says a servant will have the characteristic of undivided loyalty. That servant will have that characteristic where he is not above his Lord and he will be submissive to him. A servant will have the characteristic of seeking to please God and not men. And that, that's another issue for me personally because I like pleasing people. I'll be honest, I want to please you people. And I don't think in part that's necessarily wrong. But what it can do is frustrate you when you think you haven't pleased people and people aren't satisfied with the way things are going or whatever. And all of a sudden you can begin to get discouraged or depressed and you realize, you know what? What I've been really doing is seeking to please those folks instead of pleasing him. It doesn't really matter what I think or what Let me be fair, it's not what you think, it's what he thinks. He's the master. You're not the master. I'm not the master. He's the master, so I seek to please him. That should be my motive, right? And that should be your motive too, right? In your marriage, in raising children, as an employee or an employer, seeking to please him. Boy, we would save ourselves a lot of frustration and a lot of discouragement. Because when you go to please men, if you don't please men, you get discouraged. I just, it just came to mind this afternoon. Whatsoever you do, do what? All to the, yeah, not to the glory of men. Do all to the glory of God, do it for his sake. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. give you this funny little story. Dr. Harold Rollins, who pastored the Landmark Baptist Church in Cincinnati, Ohio, was a mega church when they weren't called mega churches. You've probably heard me say this before, but whenever he got a new staff member, so that he could teach that new staff member a servant spirit, the first day, and this is what, what I was told, he would take that, that new employee, new guy on staff, down the hall, and stop at a door, and open the door, it was a utility room, and inside was a was a uh, brush to clean toilets. And he would say, he'd grab the cleaner and he'd go down the hall and say, here's your first job, clean toilets. He said that, that, should, that he should never have done that to one of his new staff members. Well, Dr. Rawlings was kind of different. He was kind of a different man, kind of crude in some ways, but I, he got the point across. I'm just grateful Pastor Nisley didn't do that to me. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll just mow on. I don't want to clean toilets. I thought that was kind of funny when I heard that. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2 says this, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. A steward normally had a slave background. They may not have once in that stewardship, which meant he managed someone's household, may not have been a slave of the lowest degree. Nevertheless, he came from a slave background. You go back to... Gen- we don't turn there, but Genesis 25, where it speaks about, or maybe it's G- Genesis 24, where Abraham sends his chief servant, who was, it says, over his entire household. He sent him to Ur the Chaldees to get a wife for Abraham's son. And, you know, he went out and he sought a wife, of course, found Rebekah. And whenever he addressed Rebekah's family, he always referred to Isaac as his master. My master, my master. So a, a steward normally came from a slave background and they were tr- entrusted to care for the, the property and even maybe oversee the family of, of the master. And we're told here that a steward has one real requirement and that is to be faithful, to be faithful. So a characteristic of a servant, that servant seeks to be faithful. The word faithful means just that. It means that if you are faithful, you are trustworthy. Well, I would imagine that's why you take someone from the ranks of slavery and enlist them to become the steward of your household. Remember Joseph? When Joseph became, in a sense, the steward of Potiphar's house, and we're told that Potiphar had no clue as to what was going on. He just trusted Joseph because Joseph was what? Faithful. 
the word faith, faithful means trustworthy, means sure. And Joseph, you know, in doing what he did, gave Potiphar the kind of heart that said, I'm sure I can trust this young man. I can trust him with my wife, which he could. And by the way, I, I'm getting sidetracked. So I'm going to go down a rabbit trail here for just a minute, if you don't care. I think the fact that Potiphar did not put Joseph to death is an indication that Potiphar knew that his wife was a big-time liar. And he knew that she was a floozy and fooled around. But how bad it would have looked if he would have sided with his slave. So he, he took up for his wife, though I think he knew that Joseph was not guilty. Anyway, that's, that is my commentary for that portion of Genesis. All right. So a servant has the characteristic of just being faithful. So I ask you a question. Are you faithful? You start a ministry and stick to it. Now, I've, I've been in this going on 37 years now, and over the years, I've, I've seen people say, yeah, pastor, I'm going to do this ministry, and after a few times, they quit. They just quit. And sometimes they don't even tell you when they quit. They just quit. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to commit myself to giving to faith promise, and then all of a sudden, you look, and, well, we had a pledge for, you know, 45000 for the year, and only thirty seven came in. That means... Somebody wasn't faithful to do what they said. But you know, the characteristics of a steward or, a, or a, the characteristics of a servant, one of those chief characteristics is this. You will be faithful to do what you say, no matter if it hurts you or not. No matter if you get praised or not. Because remember, you're not there to please men, you're there to please God. So this is one of the chief characteristics. Another characteristic, Matthew 24, and verse 46. I thought we might have to take two weeks in this, but we're going to finish it up. Matthew chapter 24, and look at verse 46. Of course, we're in Matthew in the 24th chapter on Sunday mornings right now, so we'll see this verse later. But Matthew chapter 24, verse 46, and Jesus says, Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. One of the characteristics of a servant is that he seeks to be doing. In other words, a servant is not lazy. A servant is not lazy. Doesn't have to be told twice to do what he needs to do. He is not lazy. He is doing. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, you know the verse, many of you have it memorized. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord there's a song we used to sing it's not in our hymnal but a song called we'll work till Jesus comes is that is that your my attitude we're going to work till Jesus comes we're just going to keep serving till the day we either drop over dead or until he comes back for us we're just going to keep working to serve him is that you're in my attitude. A servant, one of their chief characteristics is he seeks to be doing, keeps himself busy serving the master, always doing. And that's exactly the point of Jesus in the response to the apostles. A, a true servant will always be doing, will always be doing. Two more than will be done. Luke chapter 14, verse 22. Luke chapter 14, and look at verse 22. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. I believe a chief characteristic of a, of a servant, he seeks to be a soul winner. He seeks to be a soul winner. He's looking for opportunities to get the gospel out. I, I full well understand that there are people who have bigger personalities and are less inhibited than other people. But when you're a servant, you don't really have a choice. Would that not be fair to say? And what does our master tell us? You go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You go. You tell them. You 
give the gospel. Uh, at Belmont, we had an adult class and another staff member uh, taught that class. And he was going over being a witness and telling people about Jesus. And a long time member of that church, a, a woman I'd been in her home, always had good fellowship with her. She blew up. I mean, there was probably 50 or 60 people in this adult class and she blew up. And she just, with no hesitation, I don't, I don't know if she screamed, but the way it was described to me, I was in another class, but the way it was described to me, she called him down. That's your job. That's why we pay you to go out and tell people about Jesus. That's not what we're supposed to do. When I heard that, it's like, whoa, really? She did say that? Man, that kind lady really said that? But I'm going to tell you something. That's the mindset of some in churches. You know, we hire a pastor, we hire an assistant pastor, we hire people to do those things. That's not our responsibility. And that is a lie from hell. That's not true. We are all we may not all be pastors, but we're all servants. Is that not true? And a servant is to go out into the highways and hedges and compel people to come in to God's house that his house may be filled. And I find it interesting that that terminology is used here. A servant does those things. So the servant seeks to be a soul winner. It's interesting, too, in Luke 24, when you go back and read the whole, the whole account, the parable, the first set of people that they went to bring in to the great feast, it's kind of a picture of the marriage supper of the Lamb, the first set of people that were supposed to go in refused. The servants go out, and they begin to say, okay, it's time to come. And they said, they, the Bible says they begin to make excuse. No, 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 I can't come because I've married a wife and I can't come. Well, that may have been legitimate, but I mean the other stuff, you know. I've, I've bought a piece of land, I haven't seen it yet, blah, 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 all those kind of things. So they make excuse. Now, here's what's interesting to me, and I make mention of this. Because when they met with, in a sense, defeat, when they met, when they, when they met with no success, the master didn't say, oh, man, guys, I'm so sorry. You went out to try to fill my house. And everybody said no, so let's just pack it up and give up. I mean, obviously, in this day and age, people aren't receptive to the gospel, so let's, let's not go into the highways and hedges and tell people about Christ. No, those same servants, he said, okay, well, they, they didn't want it. Let's go out and you find the poor and the maimed and the blind. I don't care. Find whoever you want and you compel them. Do whatever it takes to get my house filled. Now go get them. Now I'm going to tell you, in fact, I just had this conversation. I will tell you that it is more difficult today to see people saved in our culture. This isn't true in Mexico right now. But it is true in much of the United States. People don't need Jesus because they got everything else. And it is a little more difficult. And I say that because I've been doing this for a long time. I know what I'm talking about. It is a little more difficult than it was. But the fields are still white under harvest. And then you may have 99 of 100 people reject you, but there's still one. You are still, and I still, if, we're, if we have the characteristics of being a servant, are still, still supposed to be soul winners. Amen? Amen? Okay. All right, the last one. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 as we close. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and I want you to look at verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. You say, well, pastor, isn't this really speaking about ministers? And actually, I don't really know that it is speaking about ministers, but I think that's the mindset sometimes when you look at this passage. This must be addressing uh, those who are in the office of the bishop. That's who this is really be, to be applied to. But again, uh, we're all servants. We're all servants of Jesus Christ. So this final characteristics of a servant is... The servant seeks to live with humility. In other words, he deals with humility when ministering to other people. 
you know and I know because you've had, to, you've had this experience. You try to minister to someone and it's very difficult to be, maintain the spirit of humility because of the way they respond to you, the way they act around you. It's hard to always walk in humility. But you notice what he says, the servant of the Lord must not strive. What does that mean? He's not to quarrel. He's not to dispute things. Did you know there are some people that just like to quarrel? They want to dispute everything. One of my good friends in ministry has that kind of a personality. He's a pastor. He's not around here. He's in another state. And so if we're together and we start talking about an issue, if, if I say something on this side of the issue, even if he agrees with me, he will come over here and take this position. And he will argue with me every single time. That's just the way he is. He loves to argue and fight. And it's like, I, I, I get tired of talking to him, you know, because he wants to do that. That's just his personality. Now, that, I say that kind of lightheartedly, but that's not the way we should be in dealing with people, is it? We should not strive with people, even though sometimes you want to. Secondly, so we're to be gentle unto, notice this, all men. That includes those that are offensive to you. That includes those who try to hurt you. That includes those who refuse to listen to counsel. He said, the servant of the Lord must be gentle, gentle unto all men. And then he says, we're to be apt to teach. Now, how does that apply in the church house? If Pastor Vaughn comes and says to Joe Schmo, I want you to teach his class, and Joe Schmo is supposed to say, okay, Pastor, I've never taught, never taught a day in my life. And I don't read very well, but yeah, I'll teach it. Well, in a sense, yeah, I would say that. If God has dealt with me to go to Joe Schmo and say you ought to be teaching, Joe Schmo ought to say, you know what, I'm just going to believe that God has worked through you, and he wants me in this position, and God will equip me to do it. And by the way, there have been some people who have become excellent teachers through that very method, honestly. But I really think it's more this. It's looking at every opportunity as a teaching opportunity. And so I say this especially to those of us who are parents or grandparents. Be apt to teach with a servant's heart. Well, I'm off the clock. I don't want to teach right now. Okay, I mean, we just want to go fishing. So, son, let's go fishing. And you're down there at the lake, and you, you take your rod out, and you're casting the, you know, the line out. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit says, fishers of men. And so you're apt to teach, and you take the opportunity, as the Old Testament taught, the book of Deuteronomy, whether you are in the way or in the house or wherever you take opportunity to instruct your children, apt to teach, using those things that God gives you in order to, to teach somebody truth. Last night, we're planting garden. And let's say, and I was, it wasn't any of my younger kids, it was just Chris and my wife and I were out there planting the garden, but let's say, let's say you have a small child or a grandchild and there's an opportunity to talk about, you know, when you plant this seed, it's not going to be full grown by the time you get up in the morning. You're going to run out here and look to see if that, that little seed has grown, but you're not going to see anything for several weeks. You've got to have patience. And you know what? When you try to grow as a Christian, grandson, you've got to have patience and just wait on God. You know, those opportunities, apt to teach. Folks, God gives us all kinds of opportunities, and many times because we don't have the servant mode, we don't hear the Holy Spirit to be able to fulfill those things. And then the last thing he points out here is we're to be patient. We're to be patient. You don't have to raise your hand on this, but are, are there some people in your life that it's very hard to be patient with? Now, John is looking at Amy, so I <laughs> he didn't raise his hand, but I saw him looking at his wife. <laughs> I just tease him. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14 says, Be patient toward all men. But, Lord, you don't know the people I have to deal with. You don't know the kind of people that are at my workplace. You don't know the kind of people that, you know, God says, number one, what are you? Oh, I'm your servant. And are you above me or are you submissive to me? Well, I am submissive to you. Then why don't you be patient with those people and obey me? Just obey me. So... These are some of the characteristics 
that a servant ought to have. So as we've gone through this list, it'd probably been better if I had them up on the screen so you could remember them. I hope you took maybe notes tonight, but if you didn't, if you could think back to some of the things we said, I ask you a question, are you a servant? Are you a servant? Am I a servant? Or are there things I can look at and say, you know what, I'm, I, I'm not the kind of servant maybe I should be because I struggle in this particular area. And if so, you know, every time you step through the store, I don't care if it's a Wednesday night or a Sunday morning, I don't care if this auditorium is packed out or if there's a handful of people, you ought to come here with the attitude of having your lives changed and to become more like Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to just come and just come to come, including me, not just to fulfill, you know, our responsibility or whatever it may be. I, I mean, to be people who are open to the Holy Spirit to let them change us. So as you look at your life tonight, are there, are there areas where you would say, you know, I, I don't know that I'm the servant I need to be in this particular area. Now, maybe you got some great victories in the other areas. Maybe there's one or two that you say, you know what, I, I'm struggling with that. Well, let it make a difference tonight. Let it change you tonight. Earthly servants did not live with anticipation of being rewarded. And I don't know that it's necessarily the best thing to say, well, I'm going to do all these things so I can be rewarded. Now, I, I believe we ought to anticipate and look forward to reward. But I think about Luke 17, 10. So likewise, ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. Now listen, we have done that which was our duty to do. I'm just doing what my master told me to do. And it doesn't make me superior to anybody else because I choose to seek the characteristics of servanthood and live by them. It doesn't make me better than anybody else. And yet you could still take joy in the fact that John 12, 26 says, Jesus said, if any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. There's going to come a day for those of you who will be faithful to, to produce the characteristics of servanthood in your life. Here's the reality. One day when you get to heaven, the Father is going to honor you. The Father is going to honor you. One, uh, what is he going to say? Well done, thou. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I want to hear it. I bet you do too. So seek to have the characteristics of a servant, the characteristics that the word of God clearly points out that you and I as his children ought to have and wear it as a badge of honor just like the apostles did to be called the servant of Jesus Christ. All right, let's have prayer together and then we're going to divide up and pray tonight. Father, I thank you for what we have been able to see and glean from your word tonight. I'm sure there's many other things we could have, could have looked at but I pray these things that have been brought out would be an encouragement to continue in a servant's attitude toward you or, Lord, to look at some things in our lives and say, God, I'm struggling in this area, and I need you to work through me for your good. I, I ask, Lord, that you would do those things in each of us tonight. We're going to go to prayer now for folks who are in need of prayer some in greater need than others. Nevertheless, these names have been brought up because they want the prayer of your people. So I pray that you would work through this time together. And then as we leave to go home, that you give everyone safety. And Lord, we'll thank you for what you will do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we'll go to prayer.